Окей, okay, следва и следващата ни тема. Разговор, среща с истински астронавт. Аз лично много се развълнувах още в, 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 в фазата планиране а, на това събитие, тъй като за мен, както вероятно и за повечето от вас, това е за пръв път. А, днес ще срещнем с Рекс Уолхайм. Рекс е бил част от три космически мисии. Има над 36 дни в космоса и над 36 часа в открития космос. В открития космос, само по скапандър. Uh, на общо пет излизания в откритото пространство, участвал в мисиите STS-110 през 2002, STS-122 през 2008 и STS-135, известна още като последната мисия на космическа сувалка в историята. Uh, през 2020 година той се оттегля от НАСА и днес работи като директор по сигурността на мисиите в частната компания Axiom. Дами и господа, моля да посрещнем с аплодисменти Рекс Волхайм. Thank you, Peko. Welcome, Rex. Thank you. I gotta say, Rex, it's uh, it's really, really a privilege. Uh, you're probably sick of hearing that every time that somebody <laughs> talks to you, uh, but you know, it's it's really exciting for us that we actually have a living astronaut, and it's kind of surprising that you look like a normal person. Uh, <laughs> well, you thank know. you. Thank uh, you very much. And it's great to be here. Uh, did many, Bulgaria. Yeah, did, did, did many people actually ask to touch you yet? I mean, no, uh, no. <laughs> Was that any of that? <laughs> that happens going sometimes. On? Happens sometimes, I bet. But sometimes with the folks who, are, who, are, who were alive before there was a space program, so it's hard for them to believe that people go into space. So it's, uh, some of the older folks really get oh, up. Oh, really? That happened? Yeah. They were like, are you real? Yeah, You're not exactly. like yeah, they made in a Hollywood studio? Touch you. Yeah. <laughs> it's great. Uh, you know, because uh, actually I, I really want to ask you how you're dealing with this whole hero image, this whole hero thing. Because if, if, if I mean, my classification of heroes goes like this. It's nurses, teachers, and then astronauts. I'm sorry, you're yeah, in a third no, place. I'm... But how are you dealing with, with that image of being I a hero? I just really don't think about it much, except that I want to live up to the expectations that people have of me. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, for most part, it's, it's, a, it's a job I love doing, and I'm very fortunate to do it. The real heroes, I think, are some of the people you named and the, the people who serve in the militaries and stuff. And Because I tell people, that, you know, some people in the military talk to, that, say, talk to me about that, and I say, well, you know, you know when... When I'm taking my risk, you know, uh, when, when you're taking your risk, you're getting shot at, you know, when I'm taking my risk, people are cheering for me. It's yeah. so different, so it's kind of nice. There is a difference. So it's not so hard. Yeah, previously I was actually thinking of the ratio between nine-year-olds who want to become an astronaut. Well, probably not these days. They want to become influencers or something. But, yeah. but still, they're out there. Uh, so the ratio between nine-year-olds who want to become an astronaut and, and the actual people who become astronauts, and it's... it's It's enormous. Yes. So were you one of those kids? Yeah, I, I did want to become an astronaut when I was younger. I read books about space, and I didn't take it too seriously until about college time frame. And uh, then I, and, and maybe a little bit before, because I wanted to fly. I loved airplanes. So mm -hmm. my goal was to be, a, a, be, I wanted to fly for the Air Force. And, uh, and if I became an astronaut, that was icing on the cake. But I loved flying, I loved looking at airplanes, and, and I loved hearing about space, too. And then when I got in college, yeah, I did want to have the dream of going into the Air Force and becoming an astronaut. Become an astronaut, yeah. Is that the, the usual path that people take? I mean, you have to become a fighter pilot? No, you don't. And actually, that's my, my, my grand 10-year plan was to become a pilot, a fighter pilot, a test pilot, and an astronaut. And so I, I went through University of California, Berkeley for four years through ROTC to get to become an officer, became a second lieutenant in the Air Force, and my first assignment was to go down to pilot training. I, I got my, my chance to do that. And right when they get down there, they, they give you a physical to make sure you're physically qualified. And so they gave me the physical, I'd passed them before, but this time they heard a heart murmur. And uh, they said it wasn't a health hazard, but it was enough to, uh, to not let me be a pilot. Oh. So here's my 15 year plan is off the rails at week two, basically. And uh, so I, uh, I was really disappointed, I think I'll never become an astronaut and never become a pilot. And so I was despondent, but uh, I ended up taking a, a different path. I decided, well, I'll become an engineer in the Air Force. And so I worked as an engineer for several years. And they said that, uh, well, I, I could become a backseat, or I could fly in the backseat of airplanes as an engineer, not mm -hmm. as a pilot, and they could give a waiver for my heart murmur. So I said, well, I, I want to go to that school to learn how to do that. And so I applied, and the first time didn't get accepted. And then I applied a second time and got accepted. So I s went to the doctor and said, well, I have this heart murmur, they say. Um, can I get a waiver so I can go to be a f an engineer flying in airplanes? And they said, they examined me, and they said, well, you don't need a waiver because you don't have a heart murmur. It turns out I didn't have a heart murmur after all. Oh, my God. Yeah, so, uh, so I, and I had a very different career path than I, than I expected to take. So I went from, uh, from pilot training. I got eliminated from that, so I couldn't do that. 
and then uh, they sent me to North Dakota to a radar site up there, and then uh, I finally came down to the Johnson Space Center as an engineer working in mission control, not mm -hmm. as an astronaut, started learning how to do this flight test as an engineer, and then I had the experience, and I didn't have a physical qual problem, so I was able to become an astronaut at that point. So most people don't say, I'm going to become an astronaut, so I think I'll get um, eliminated from pilot training, and then I'll yep. go up to North Dakota and be at a radar site, <laughs> and then that should set me up perfectly. So that, that the path I took was much different than I expected. Right. All right, so once you, once you get there, um, I mean, what is, can, can you guide us through the selection process? Because uh, the other day when we were having dinner and you left early and we allowed ourselves to discuss your personality <laughs> and uh, we ended up uh, with the conclusion that you have a very well rounded up personality. I mean, you're a very well, thank you. nice, attentive guy, like calm. Uh, it's, is that a prerequisite to become an astronaut? You know, it's, it's not written down, but it's what we kind of select for. So mm -hmm. we, we start out with maybe, uh, you know, four or 5,000 or even more applicants. 5,000. Yeah, or sometimes over 10,000. Um, and we, we first narrow them down to who's qualified, because some people will send them an application and they, haven't, they don't have the right degrees or some of the experience, and so they'll, they'll move some of them out. Then they'll start looking at the ones that are the most promising, and they'll, they'll start looking at, uh, you know, what they've done in their careers and make sure they have all the right, uh, right experience. And uh, the highest, highest ranking ones are what we call highly qualified, and they start sending references out, people to send them to their old bosses and send them to people who know them. And we get references back, and we learn about what these people are like. And then from those, the ones that, are the, that seem the most highly qualified, we bring down to Houston to, to interview. And we interview about 120 people and select mm -hmm. maybe 10 or 20 at this point. Wow. Um, and so at the interview process, you know those people are qualified to be astronauts. We, they've met all the basic qualifications, but then you look for the soft skills. Are they mm -hmm. good with people? Are they good on teams? And uh, do you think they'd be a person you'd like to live with for six months in a small, confined space? Sure, yeah. yeah. It, it, it's funny how one of the most important parts of the uh, selective process is actually the subjective opinion of yes. people who know them. Yes. Oh, that's, that, that was surprising for me. Yeah, because yeah. it's nice to know what other people think of them, and not just the people they list, but if you know somebody else who worked with them, you know, if they... Uh, if they were really, really good at their job, but they treated the, the secretaries or somebody poorly, you know, that reflects poorly on. They should be treating everybody the same. Yeah, yeah, makes sense. Okay, guide this through the, like, the preparation. I mean, so, okay, so you're select, selected sure. to become an astronaut. So sure. how do you end up on board of the space shuttle? Okay, so the, the training process starts, and uh, they're one of the, they, 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 they decide they have a crew, and they, they name you, and, the, and you're all excited, but you train for about a year as a crew. And there's several ways. You obviously have all the simulator training and all, this, all the training for the mission, but one of the things we like to do is we like to start the team together and make them uh, be a cohesive team. And one of the ways we do that is through a, uh, a place called the National Outdoor Leadership School. And so if I can bring my slides up, I'll, uh, I'll show you a little bit about, uh, about how that worked. Um, what it is, they take, they, they take the group of you, and you take it to a, a remote area. And so this is my second crew, SDS-122. And... Uh, we went out to a, the Canyonlands in Utah, mm -hmm. and for 10 days we went backpacking and, and hiking in various areas, and, and you get tired and wet and cold and... Uh, and grumpy. And grumpy, exactly. <laughs> yeah. But they want, you to see, they want you to see each other at your worst, to learn to, and also to learn to have coping skills. They want mm -hmm. to you, teach you how to cope with, with, with adversity, and they want you to see how your buddies that are going to be on your crew how they, hey, how they uh, um, react to adversity. So, for instance, when my co crewmate Leland would get a little bit grumpy, he was probably hungry, so just throw him some food, he'd be <laughs> fine. When, so, when, uh, when Dex would get, to, uh, would get a little bit tired, he wouldn't always admit it. So sometimes you kind of just have to take, mm. you know, take, you know, understand that and, and help out when, when you need it. So, so that's a great way to, uh, to get to know each other, to bond as a crew. So that was a, a lot of fun. But then what they do is uh, you, you get back to Houston, you start your training, and you start uh, various... Uh, um, various training on all different parts of your mission. So this is a, one of the things, important things we train on is in the simulator is our, our big pool, which is how we train for spacewalking. So this is a picture of me getting dunked into the pool, and I'll show you here what it looks like underneath the pool. And you can see this is a, a picture. It's got both the space station above and the pool on the bottom because the pool is where we train. And it's an actually an excellent training tool. Um, is that an exact replica of uh, the, the, the space station pod that you're going to be working yeah, on? Yes, so in the bottom of the pool is a full-size replica of the space station. But you now you look at that picture and you'll see that it looks plastic, so it's not highly shiny metal and stuff like that. And so from a visual standpoint, it's not exactly like the space station, but dimensionally, uh, by measurement-wise, it's perfect. Mm -hmm. So if there's a handrail down in the pool, there's a handrail in space the same place. So you go do your spacewalks over and over again, and sometimes I do my spacewalks maybe 10 times before I had actually done a spacewalk. 
And I know, okay, here I got to look out for an antenna. Okay, here I got to watch out for my back. Here I, and I just know all those different hazards and stuff that come along. Because you develop a muscle memory, kind of like a muscle memory when you play an instrument like the piano. You don't yeah. think about what your fingers are doing. You just do it. And so similar, uh, spacewalking can be the same type of thing. Yeah, yeah. I, I remember how modestly you, you said, I think Robin was, uh, was sh like, like kind, kind of feel surprised by, by that, how modestly you explained that how you built parts of the International Space Station. It's like you're building a cupboard from Ikea. Yeah, uh, it, it's it, nothing special. You know, it, well, they, they train you so well. So I'm not the most mechanically inclined person, even though I'm a mechanical engineer. So I don't build things, whereas a lot of people do, which is a helpful skill. But they train you so well in Houston. They, they, we go over these, these spacewalks so many times, we, it's ingrained in us. They say, okay, we need to turn this bolt you know, 14 times clockwise to a torque of you know, 14.5 foot-pounds. And so you get used to what you have to do, and, the things that, and, you, and you find ways to finesse them and make it a little bit easier and put the tasks together so that they all fit into about a six-and-a-half to seven-and-a-half-hour spacewalk. Right, right. Uh, so just to step back on the behavioral side, because uh, I'm, I'm, I'm curious, while you were as a group secluded there in the, in the, in the desert, uh, is there a person planted there who is observing the group yes. dynamic? Yes, we had a, a, a National Outdoor Leadership School uh, uh, instructor who was there with us. Okay. We actually also brought our flight director, the guy in charge of the control center on the ground, mm -hmm. and the guy who was scheduled to do that went with us so he could observe us too and kind of work with us and we could work with him and, and know how they interact. Mm -hmm. So at the end of the day, he's the person who's saying, okay, they don't work well. Yeah, he, he, he can you. put that input if he wanted to, potentially, yeah. All right, so. it's like the political commissar in yeah, previous yeah. times. You probably hated that guy. No, right? it was okay. <laughs> he was all right, so it wasn't a problem. Uh, so then, uh, while, whilst you were doing all that, uh, you did say you were not uh, um, um, a fighter pilot before. So you right. did have to get some, some no, pilot training. No, I, I, we, we got aviation training. So if we continue on the slides here in a little bit. So I, I was a, uh, a flight test engineer in the Air Force, so I'd flown before, but there's some astronauts who've never flown before. Right. And so they may be a scientist, uh, you know, like, you know, if David or Robin uh, or, or Zach became an astronaut. God forbid. They, yeah, <laughs> they would learn to fly in the T-38 aircraft here, and they don't become a pilot. You know, it's a two-seat airplane, so the, the, the pilots and test pilots, they sit in the front. Mission specialists like myself, we sit in the back. But we uh, learned to fly together, so we learned to work together. So the pilot flies, and the person in the back does the communications, navigation, and, and, uh, and we work together to be become a team. Now, we have regular simulators like airliner simulators that yep. we, we practice the space shuttle stuff with, but all those simulators, they're just simulators. So if you crash it, you know, you just start it over again, and, and, and you try it again. And so you get that mentality that it's not real, which it isn't. This is the one place we train that's real. There's, you have aviation environment, and if you have an emergency there, you have to handle it yourself. And so you need to learn to work together and handle difficult situations in a stressful environment without getting you know, too upset. You know? So that's what it's great for. It's also great because you can fly different places, and here's us flying formation. Uh, and it's a great place to get to various meetings and stuff across the country, and it's fully acrobatic, so you can, can get yourself in unusual attitudes and get used to some of the G-forces you, you feel in space flight, mm -hmm. too. So all that, all that kind of training helps. So you don't get to sit in a space shuttle before the actual flight? Uh, it's do. only simulator training? It's mostly simulator, but you, you, you maybe go into the, the space shuttle maybe a few times just to see where things are laid out, but you don't practice your mission in the space shuttle. You right. do that in simulators. So even the pilots don't practice landing? No, they don't practice landing. This, they, they actually have, we, we used to have a, 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 what's called the shuttle training aircraft. So the space shuttle was kind of flew like a brick. You know, it was not a sleek jet like those T-38s were. Mm -hmm. So it was, very, uh, it was a very blunt object. So it had a very strange flying character. So it came down like a rock, kind of. Right. And so we had a shuttle training aircraft that was a, a modified Gulfstream aircraft that would fly very steep, and it would actually try to mimic the space shuttle's approach, mm -hmm. which, is, which is about six times steeper than an airliner. So it's very, very steep, and then they have to flare it at the end. And so they would practice many times over and over in this, uh, in this space shuttle training aircraft. Because, and they had to fly it about, a thousand, about 500 times before they flew the first time. Because 500 times? 500 times. You have one chance. It's a glider. The space shuttle's a glider. You have to line up with the runway and land, because if you don't like the way it's lined up, that's your last chance. 500 times? Yeah, 500 times of 500 approaches, and then maybe 10 times on each flight oh. or so, and then before they're fl a pilot, and as a commander, they're supposed to fly it about 1,000 times. So oh, wow. many, many times. Training an astronaut yeah. is expensive. Yeah, it takes, a lot of, it takes a lot of time. All right. Okay, so let's, uh, uh, we have a picture of the crew of uh, the last mission uh -huh. that, you, that, you, that you had with, yes. the, with the space show. Can we, can we actually see that? Or let's see, is well, it, let's, let's show how we trained for it. Yeah, so this is, this is our crew that we uh, trained for SDS-135. So our, our, that was the final space shuttle mission. 
And so this is uh, getting ready on launch day. So we finished all our training and uh, launch day. You never know what day is going to be your actual launch day because uh, it could be that you know weather problems happen or mm -hmm. or the uh, um, or the mechanical problems happen on this on the space shuttle. So you practice for it and you get ready for it like it's the big game, like it's the big soccer match, or the big Super Bowl or big baseball game, and you're ready for it, but you never know for sure it's going to happen. But about uh, three hours before launch, you get your orange launch and entry suits on there and uh, and then head out to the launch pad. And, uh, and then you go across, you get up there and you sit in the, in the cockpit and you wait. And it's, you see, the, it's very serene right there. You sit on your back and it's all, the, the, you know, the, the vehicle is powered, but it's not moving or anything. So it feels like you're sitting in a 14-story you know, building and you're on your back and everything's very calm and you get used to it, you know, and, you know, you crack some take jokes nap, and stuff. Yeah, you, know, you could take a nap if you want to potentially. And you wait for about maybe an hour and a half to two hours doing some communications checks and stuff and trying to tell some jokes and trying to remain calm. And on our launch day, there was only, a, there was only about a 30% chance to go because of weather. And so we were thinking, well, I'm not sure whether we're going to launch mm -hmm. or not. And so um, they counted down and uh, all the way down to 31 seconds and then the clock stopped. And we're like going, what's happening? There was no alarms or anything. And uh, at that moment, we hear on our, on our intercoms that the, uh, the launch count has halted due to a failure. And we're like, what kind of failure? You know, <laughs> There was no alarms or anything, so we didn't know what's going on. So we're thinking, okay, now we're not going to launch because uh, you know, we, we can only hold for about just uh, actually at that point, probably only a minute or so. And uh, so if they're not going to fix that. They never can fix something that fast. But what turns out was there was a, a swing arm above the space shuttle that has to move out of the way before you launch because it's considered bad form to take part of the launch pad with you when you go to launch. <laughs> so they, they thought it was rotated back, but one, one data point said it wasn't rotated back. So they, uh, so they said, okay, well, we'll check it with the camera. So they swung a camera over, and they looked at it, and it was rotated out of the way. Say, so okay, we're going to pick up the count. So when they pick, say you're going to pick up the count from 31 seconds, that doesn't give you a lot <laughs> of time ready. to collect your thoughts. You know, oh my goodness, we're going today. So you get ready to go. Buckle up. And so, uh, so then you count down for 31 seconds, and, and all of a sudden at uh, T minus six seconds, the main engines come up. Now you see here, this picture here, the main engines have, are firing, and so we're, we're getting ready to go, but we're not flying yet because the, for six seconds, the, uh, the computers check the main engines, and if, if they're not working properly, they'll shut them down, and you won't go flying that day. But for six seconds, uh, you, you, you feel this incredible vehicle come alive. And so you were sitting in this 14-story building. All of a sudden, it shakes so hard, it feels like it's coming apart. It's unbelievable how much it shakes. It looks calm on, in the pictures like that, but man, it's shaking so bad, it's hard to read your instruments for a little bit. But I remember on my first mission, uh, I, thinking, you know, you could, I could see out my mirror out, out the, the window above us, and I could, I could see the, the exhaust coming out like that. And you're thinking, six seconds. It's only got to last six seconds. And come on, come on. And then T minus zero, you go, boom. You feel this kick in the back, and you feel the, And then all of a sudden, I felt the vibration of the uh, vehicle, and I thought, this feels just like the simulator, except now you got this acceleration that's crazy. But the vibration pattern was like, this is it. We're going to space today. You know, they can't change their mind. We get to do the job. It's really exciting. So you, you, you jump off the pad, and uh, you're going, uh, you know, 160 kilometers per hour by the time you, straight up by the time you finish clearing the pad. And uh, it's pretty an amazing feeling. It's, it sounds pretty terrifying, especially the anticipation bit. I mean, you're an engineer. You know that uh, the space shuttle has, what, like 2.5 million it's, it's a lot of parts. moving components. right. right. And each one of them can break yeah, at any point. And, and built by the lowest bidder, so. <laughs> That's a good point. Yep, yep. So, as they like to say. But, you know, th th your first mission, it's exciting because you want so bad to go. You know, like w when I was trying to become a pilot and then wasn't able to become a pilot, you, you've had your dreams pulled from, out from underneath you before. And so there's a lot of stuff that goes back in your mind that think, you know, hey, well, this is not really going to happen. You know, it's, something, it's just too hard to picture yourself actually getting to go to space. And so... Uh, um, when the, your first mission, you just want it so much. I'd been training for about five and a half years at that point before I got yeah. to fly as an astronaut. You know, is this really going to happen? And then you feel those solid rockets light, and, and hey, this is really going to happen. So it's an incredible feeling of adrenaline, like this is it. This is great. So, you know, th but the interesting thing about the ascent, the launch, is that usually we go in the simulator, and they always have everything breaking, and so you're constantly working on things so that on the real day, with less things break, you can handle them, you know? Whoa, so wait, 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 wait. You said constantly things are breaking while On the simulator. Oh, so on the they, simulator. They okay, simulator, okay, okay. So they're okay. constantly having alarms and bells and whistles mm -hmm, going off, mm -hmm. and you're constantly fixing stuff. On the real day, 
almost nothing goes wrong, at least on most of the flights. And so uh, on the first flight, I, we went all the way up to the uh, orbit with nothing going wrong. So you're kind of looking around going, this is weird, you know. <laughs> on my last flight, though, we did have an alarm. This was a bit scary um, the, uh, for, for a couple minutes. We got a, uh, at about, probably about 40 seconds, after, 30 or 40 seconds after launch, we got, a, we got an alarm, and it says DPDT, which means delta pressure over delta time, which means you're leaking air, potentially. And so we, I get the message, and I look quickly up to the gauge, and they're like, how big is it? And we're looking at, it's a big leak. This, if this is real, this will cause an abort, potentially. And so for a few seconds, my heart was pumping. And then the ground quickly said, no, it's not real. That's what's called cabin stretch. As you go up in the atmosphere, the cabin stretches a little bit. As, as, as you know from science, as the volume goes up, the pressure goes down. So as we went up, the, the volume went up, the pressure went down. They thought it was a leak, you know. But they, they've seen this before. I'd never seen any of my missions before. So for a few seconds, I'm thinking, holy cow, it's going to be an abort, which would be what's called a return to launch site abort, which means you go up and then you turn around. You're flying backwards through your plume, drop the tank, drop the SRBs, you know, and then come back in for a landing at the Kennedy Space Center. It's like Did that ever happen? Never had to do it, but I looked like it might have to do it for the first time. So yeah. I was thinking, that's not good. But my guests would have seen a launch and a landing on the same day, so that would have been a, a bonus for them. Wow. So, uh, but that, uh, like I say, most time that, uh, that uh, you go up on the, on the launch sequence and nothing happens. And so uh, it's uh, usually, it's, it's a nice feeling. Did you, <laughs> no, it's a, it's a silly question, but I imagine in this space when, every, when everything is shaking, yeah. and it's literally the first time for everyone, right? right? I mean, it's like, because they did it only on a simulator. Or before. the other folks who have flown before have seen it sure, before. Sure, but right. yeah, yeah. yeah. Are there any cases in which a person is like, okay, no, 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 let, let me down. Yeah, just, that, yeah. I'm, I'm done. No, that's... Fortunately not. No, so uh, I think we've trained them enough that they can handle it, and yeah. uh, I'm sure selected. there's nerves going on. So, like, the one, one t interesting story I heard was um, the, uh, when the first space shuttle flew, which they had never been, you know, John Young and Bob Crippen, they flew on the first time. And, uh, and the, the, uh, the, the first time they flew on the vehicle, they, Bob Crippen, he had never flown in space before. John Young had gone to the moon. And uh, Bob Crippen was, was said, well, just do what John does. Whatever John does, you know, do what he does. And so John Young was on the, I guess they were on the launch pad before the launch, and John Young's wiping the sweat off his hands. <laughs> so he's, he's going, well, maybe that's not the best thing to do. So, so he was a little bit nervous, too. But you can imagine, the space shuttle was the first vehicle ever flown, what was flown, never flown unmanned. So it was never without a crew before the first crew went on. So they, they were the first ones to get on that vehicle the first time it flew, and it had mm. people on it. So that was a, a gutsy crew. Yeah. So you're obviously terrified or oddly calm in, in, in all of these missions, but I can imagine what it's like, uh, you know, first of all, for the thousands of people who are working on this program and on this, on this specific launch, but you have a family. Right. And you had young kids when you initially started. Yes. You know, so can you, can you, how, how did you guys cope with that? Yeah, so the, the, when the kids were young when I first flew, they, they didn't understand a whole lot about it, you know. So I remember saying goodnight to my kids when I was going into quarantine and say, okay, well, I'm going into quarantine. I'll be gone for a week. Then I'm going to go in space for, for a couple weeks, and I'll be home. And they're like, okay. You know, so like it was nothing <laughs> fun, you know. So that was no problem. As they got older, they understood a little risk a little bit more, but they still was enjoyable to them. But you can imagine it is a, a stressful time for them. So if we go back to our slides here, you launch off the launch pad, and as you're climbing out, uh, you, you head out, and those, those two white rockets, they burn for about two minutes, and then the, 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 the extra t external tank, that burns for another six and a half, so you, you go from eight and a half minutes, you go from zero to uh, 25,000 kilometers an hour in eight and a half minutes, so you're getting shot off the planet. And you mentioned my family, and so uh, this is a picture of them watching me riding that controlled explosion in the background. That's my wife, Margie, and on my left, my son, Alex, and my son, Jeffrey. And so it's, it's, it's tough to, to handle, you know, launch day is a, a big day for the astronauts, but it's, it's a, real, a real big day for the families, too. And it is, uh, I think this picture shows the, uh, the emotion there. Yeah, I almost cried when I saw that. Yeah. W w was your wife ever like, no, you're done? Yeah, well, that she, was the she, yeah, last so time you're doing this. She, she, the, the interesting thing was, so uh, after my first flight, after I flew in uh, 2002, the Columbia accident happened, and she was, uh, so you're not going to go again, are you? And I go, yes, I am. I'm not going to, I don't want to stop that, let stop from, from flying again. And so I figured, but I'll fly one more time. And so um, the, uh, the second time I flew, you know, I figured, okay, that's probably my last time. Um, and then I, it was an interesting thing, I, 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 it's kind of a long story, but I ended up having cancer after my second flight, and I had, I had prostate cancer, and, as, and I had to have surgery, and I was going into surgery, my wife was trying to cheer me up a little bit, so, you know, thinking, I thinking, you know, what's, what all's going to happen and stuff, she goes, you know, after this, if you really want to fly again, you can, 
you know. And, and she was trying to cheer me up, so I wasn't going to hold her to that. Yeah. But sure enough, after the flight, um, I, I recovered and everything was fine, and so I had a chance to fly again potentially. So there were three flights left: STS-132, uh, 33, and 34. And so I went back to the chief of the office and said, "Hey, I'm 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 be qualified, and I I want to fly on one of those last flights if I can." And they. Uh, they came out and said, well, no, th that uh, they've assigned other crews, and so I thought, okay, we'll never get to fly again. Well, at least it was nice trying, you know. And they started talking about adding one more flight, and mm -hmm. so uh, SDS-135. And so at that point, I, you know, I volunteered again, of course, and, uh, and this time I got picked. So it was really, really exciting. And at first, we weren't an actual mission. We were going to be the rescue mission if 134 had a problem. Mm -hmm. And so we were only fly if it was a rescue mission. But, you know, I had in my mind that, yeah, if we have one le tank left and we have two solid rocket boosters left and we got a shuttle... There's no way we're going to let those things sit on the launch pad and not launch them. It's like yeah. having one firework left in the box at, you know, on, on the 4th of July for the Americans when we send out the fireworks and not setting it off. It's like, no, they'll set that off. You know, they'll send it up, and sure enough, we did. So that worked mm -hmm. out great. It's interesting that uh, it's not like you're not a superhero enough, and now I find out you beat cancer also. Of course you yeah. did. <laughs> yeah, it's a, of course you did. All right, so now you're in space, and there yeah. are some awesome images uh, that, that you can show us uh, here. Uh, one of them is from the inside of the, of the shuttle. Sure. Yeah, uh, now I've seen other photos of the inside of the shuttle. Do you actually know? I'm sorry for the, you know, infantile question, but do you actually know what all these buttons do? Yeah, we do, pretty much, you know. So it's, it's, there's, there's it's hundreds crazy. of buttons and switches. And so, because this is 1980s tech, 70s and 80s technology, so the space shuttle has tons of buttons and switches. And so we had to learn those, and we had to learn as a team. We had four of us, a pilot, a, com a commander, a pilot, and two mission specialists that helped fly the vehicle on launch. And so they, they trained us over and over about what everything did, pretty much. And there was stuff we still needed procedures for, but we had a basic knowledge of what almost everything did, unless mm -hmm. it was a very arcane switch. Um, so this is in, inside the cockpit in the commander's seat there. So once you get to orbit, you get to take off the orange suit and wear regular clothes and, uh, and go to work. Look how happy you are. That's right. So you, you made it to space, you can live to tell about it, you know. So, yeah. um, but uh, so you get into space, and this is a, a picture of us uh, rendezvousing with the space station. Our job on STS-135, the final mission, was to bring up supplies to the space station. So this is a picture of us over the Caribbean uh, near the Bahamas, which is just spectacular from space because you have that, the turquoise blues and stuff. It's really amazing. So this picture taken from the space station of us uh, approaching the space station. Did you get to look out of the window a lot? Okay. Yeah, you did. You did. It had a chance, but not a lot. You know, you were, it was, you were so busy that, you, you, you know, when you had a chance here or a chance there, you looked out the window the best you could, and mostly at the end of the day when everything was done, but because you were kind of so busy uh, during the daytime. And sometimes during the spacewalks, you could look outside, too, um, but, uh, you know, that was really a busy time, too. But once in a while, they'd have a little bit of a break where you could look out and say, wow, it's just amazing as you see, the, uh, you know, see Europe or see America going by underneath you. Uh, d d d does it happen, this normal process of, like, normalization? You just go and, like, meh. Nah. Yeah. You know, it never really That's does. That's the Himalayas it's, it's again. Actually so, it's actually so overwhelming. At the, you fly the first time, and it's hard to process it all. And to me you, won't remember it, you won't remember it all because it's so overwhelming that you can't process it and can't remember all that. So my, one of my crewmates said, just burn this into your memory. Take pictures in your mind. And so there were certain things I'd try. Okay, I'm going to remember this. And you try to do that. But it, it is so overwhelming that it, it never gets old. And it's, you know, the Earth has covered 70% of water. So most of the time you're over the ocean. And so when you're looking down at the ocean, it, you know, it's pretty, but it's nothing like going over places you've been before and seeing lakes and mountains and cities and stuff like that. So that's most spectacular. So usually we, when we went over land is when we'd start looking out the window when we could. Yeah. It's, you, you, I mean, okay, so what is the most memorable, like, image that you, that you well, captured we can, in yeah, your Yeah, we can mind. show a few I mean, of them here. Let's, let's we go in, uh, this is a picture approaching the space station. So we approach, it's about the size of a, fi a five or six bedroom house. And so we, uh, we approach and we dock at the front side there. You see the big solar arrays there. And, uh. And uh, this is a picture of a spacewalk, so I'll t tell you a little bit about how we, we train for that. That's one of the, the most memorable pictures is when you're looking out when you're actually outside and stuff. So That's not you? That, that's, that's me you. on the end that's of the you. Columbus okay. module, mm -hmm. yeah, there. So um, before you go out the spacewalk, you hook a tether on. It's a retractable tether, kind of like those big dog leashes that you can mm -hmm. go out for mm -hmm. you know, a long ways. They can go for 85 feet, you know, about 30 meters or so, somewhere around there. And... Uh, so uh, you put that on, and then you can w go hand over hand to, to walk in space, basically using your hands. And, you, and you, when you get to a location like there where I am, you put a, te a smaller tether down so that you won't float away when you're working with both hands. The other way to do a space walk is, is on the robotic arm. So you, you get on the end of the robotic arm. It's like it's probably 20 meters long or longer. 
and you, you hook your feet in there, and then they can take you wherever you want to go, which is great because then you can work with both hands and take me over here, and over there. And so it works is that out. the Canadian arm? Yeah, like the Canadian arm, Canada okay. arm. Yeah, so that's, that's one way of doing it. Now, when you're, when you're uh, doing a space walk, when you're going in space anywhere, you're in orbit, you're going around the Earth every 90 minutes. That's all it takes to go around the entire Earth. So for 45 minutes, you're in front of the Earth, like that last picture, where it's nice and sunny, you know? What happens 45 minutes later when you're behind the Earth, you know? It gets dark, you know? So you're in 45 minutes of darkness after that. So when you do spacewalks, what you do is you see those two lights above my head. Those are my helmet lights. So the sun's going down there, so I turn the helmet lights on, and you get an idea of how dark it can get here, like that. So that's that same oh, wow. area there, so you're working at night. So you're working for 45 minutes of daylight, then 45 minutes of night. So it's... Uh, it, uh, it constantly changes, and it gets pretty dark out there, too. So while, so. while you're doing all that, did you ever get to turn and just, like, immerse yourself in the darkness? I mean, how, how you does You know, that you, can, if you can't see the stars because your helmet lights drown out the stars at night unless you're brave enough to turn your helmet lights off. And uh, I, don't, I think I may have done that once, if, if any, but uh, so I could maybe see one star or something like that. But, but you, you, I, it, I didn't really have the desire to go into pitch black at that point, I'll tell you that much. So. Really? You never tried that after like five walks? No, no, I never really did, did much of that. You know, I, there were times where I could see down and, and you could see some, you know, fires in Africa and stuff. It was really pretty amazing, but I never really needed to turn my helmet lights off. The most spectacular views were, were when, you, uh, when you were in the daytime over various parts of the earth, which yeah. is amazing. Um, one time I was, uh, you know, like I say, you don't have a whole lot of time to look down, but one time I was at the end of my fifth spacewalk, the last one, I was ready to come in, so now I had everything done, so I could, you know, I had a little bit of time, and they, and they told me that, hey, we're coming up over the coast of California. And so I said, well, I got to see this, you know, yeah. and so it turned out, because I grew up in California, right over San Francisco, and I looked down, and I could see the coast of California, and the whole west coast of the United States really coming at me, coming underneath me, and just, it was just absolutely spectacular. You could see for, you know, about... Uh, about 1,600 kilometers in any direction. So you could, if I looked down, I could probably see it from Canada down to Mexico. It's just, just yeah. gorgeous. But I have some pictures a little bit like that. So it, it, we have, uh, this is the crew we had, the, uh, the 10 of us uh, on the space station. And we worked together as one team, the Russians, Americans, and Japanese on this, in this particular instance. And it's the m best example of international cooperation I've ever, I've ever been a part of. And all of them are cool people. Yes, they are. So None of them is an asshole. No, well, you never know. You know, some people have their ups and downs, but uh, yeah. you work together. We have a module in the, in, the, in the space station called the cupola, so it's a window module, mm -hmm. and so you can look in any direction there, so that's one of the best places to look out. Does it get back? <laughs> it <laughs> does at times, yes. Yeah, so people get back. Hey, we're going over like this, like picture this. This is with a little bit of a telephoto lens. That's uh, San Francisco, so that's the, the Bay Area where I grew up, and so I had a chance to fly over my hometown, and mm -hmm. before I flew my first mission, I said, okay, I need to find out where San Carlos is, where I grew up, and so I could find out. You look over, the, find this highway, find this lake, and go to the other side of the highway, and that's San Carlos, and sure enough, with, the, with binoculars, I could see my hometown. You know, but you're going by at, you know, uh, you know 25,000 kilometers an hour. So even yeah. though you're high up, it doesn't take long before it's going off the limb. It, it's funny how this, uh, this never changes, you know, since you were a kid. It's like, hey, I can see my house. That's right, know, exactly. Yeah, I can see the neighbor. I can see the streets, that, you know, that area that I grew up in. It's pretty amazing. Can we see, uh, see the picture of London that you took? Yeah, so that's London at night. So that, that's from another, I think another group took this picture. But uh, it shows you what the cities from in space look like at night if you get nice, nice and dark. And this is one of my favorite pictures, one of places to look at over the earth. This is the, the, as you can probably tell, this is the Middle East. And you look down there, and it looks so pretty. And uh, then you think about it, you know, this is, this is some of the most war-torn areas of the world right there. You're looking down at Israel and Egypt and, uh, and Syria and, uh, and Iraq off the corner. And then you, you look at this picture, and then you see, if you look at the edge of the earth, you can barely see it. There's this thin blue band. It's just almost barely imperceptible. And you look at that, and that is our atmosphere. That is all that keeps us alive. And you, when you look at it from this perspective, you see that there is a lot more important things that we have in common down there than we have that separates us apart. And when you're on a spaceship and you're this, in this outpost in humanity, the only 10 people off the planet of the Earth, at that time, you realize that you, know, you have to work together. And you look down at that Earth and you realize that that is something that we need to, that we are fellow passengers on this spaceship. Because you, this, the Earth is a spaceship. You know? It's yeah. going around the, around the solar system once every year. It's, it's, and when you get a chance to see a, the Earth like this, it's amazing because you see that black. And that black is not a dark black. It's an absence. It's a void. And you get a sense of that. It is so dark. It is really stark. And when you, see, you can't see the entire Earth underneath you because we're only 200 miles up. But you do get a sensation at times that that's our planet. It's just hanging out there in the middle of nothing. And so it is amazing that uh, it changes your perspective a bit. Now, the other thing that's fun about this area is one thing I like to do is, uh, you know, you, 
People have probably heard, have you ever heard you can see the Great Wall of China from space? You guys heard that before? Sure. Yeah, you can't see the Great Wall of China from space. I mean, it's, it's I, I've, I, I don't think I've ever come to the astronaut and admit they've seen it. Maybe with binoculars on the certain days, when because it blends in with the background and it's, it, it's thin from up above, yeah. so you can't really see it. But one thing you can see from space is the, is the pyramids. And so I'll, I'll teach you how to find those here if you show this picture. So the first thing you do is you find the Mediterranean Sea. What you see there, you see the Mediterranean, you see Turkey up at the top. And then you look for the Nile River, which is just off to the, to the left here. So we'll zoom in to the, toward the Nile River. And so this is the Nile River going up and down there. And you see, look for the city of Cairo. And Cairo is, it crosses the Nile River there, and it's gray. And so you see in this picture that gray area, that whole gray area that crosses the Nile and goes up to the desert, that's, that's, uh, that's Cairo. Now, what you want to find the pyramids, what you do is you go from where the, the city, that gray part, just meets the desert line. And mm -hmm. right at that line, we'll zoom in here with a little bigger lens, there's the pyramids. You see them right there in the, uh, on the top where the, the city meets the desert. So it's really pretty easy to find the pyramids. So that's pretty yeah. cool to see. It's so. funny how you're teaching us like we yeah. will ever go to space. Well, you know, so well, next we, we next time you go there, you'll know how to, you know how to find it. <laughs> and then uh, we, we, uh, we undock after about a week or so at the space station, and then we, uh, we fly home like an airplane. We fire our jets. And that we go so fast that the that we the air f forms a plasma around us, and that's us at the, the tip of that. And this is you that's, yes. landing. And when my when my uh, son Jeff saw that, he goes, "Wow, that looks like a, a meteor." And I go, "Jeffrey, I'm inside that meteor." <laughs> and when you're inside there, when you land at daytime, the daylight kind of blinds out the plasma around you. But when you land like this at night. There's no question that you're in a, you're in, a uh, in front of a meteor because it's like being in a blast furnace. And to all the windows of the space shuttle are covered in this orange glow, and it's like you're in a kiln, you know, like the firing of pottery. Yeah. And it's uh, all sorts of flames licking around you, and it is it is a little bit scary. And it's like you drop under that about five minutes, and you go, "I'm glad we're under that," you know. So it was, uh, and and then you start flying. It's a strange sensation because this floating space pl spaceship all of a sudden becomes an airplane. You start feeling some vibrations and stuff and wind turbulence, and uh, all of a sudden you're back flying, and, and you look down, there's a runway down there, and you go, how'd that happen? You know, it's really, <laughs> really pretty amazing. And, uh, and we fly like a, a regular airplane and land like an airplane. Oh, only. we got the chemtrails here, you guys as well? Yeah. Yes, okay. yep. <laughs> it's a beautiful, yeah, it's a beautiful yeah. photo. Yeah, it's a beautiful picture. You know, I'm curious when you uh, now that you mentioned your son. I'm curious how they perceive you as you know, dad being an astronaut. And you're probably just a regular dad, just telling yeah. dad jokes. Yes, They're probably exactly. sick of you and annoyed. Yeah. you know, like like kids usually are. Yes. So it, 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 it will be funny to to talk with them. Yeah. Yeah. So they, they 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 they're so used to it doesn't really yeah. doesn't just, really phase them. Yeah. Yeah. Dad. Don't embarrass me, Dad. Yeah, exactly. That's mostly in front of my friends. And, and Dad jokes, of course. You know, <laughs> dad so. jokes, yeah, they're there. Oh, okay, so this is uh, this is in the past, and I and I obviously you're cherishing all these amazing memories, and I bet the transform the, 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 the transformation is is difficult. I mean, this sounds like the most the, the, the most scary and exciting and amazing things that a human being can do. Yes. And now you're stuck here, working for Axiom. Yeah. So what are, you, what are you guys doing? I mean, how do you, uh, how, uh, first of all, how did you handle this, this transformation? Well, it wasn't really big and of a, a transformation because you realize I was an astronaut for 24 years and I spent 36 days in space. Oh, so you were sick of it. That's no, okay. <laughs> so, so I, I enjoyed being an astronaut, but the time, and for most astronauts, it, it, unless you go a long duration flight for six months, which some folks do, which I didn't have a chance to do, and I, I didn't, get, uh, didn't get to do, but uh, my flights were, were shorter, so there's a time where I spend like about one day on the ground for, for every day I send in space, or close to it. Mm -hmm. So less, less than, uh, you know, two days in space per, day on uh, per year on the ground, which means that most of my time as an astronaut is spent on the ground. Sure. Yep. And so I was used to that, and I didn't mind that. You know, I enjoyed being an astronaut. I enjoyed training in the T-38, and I enjoyed, you know, doing outreach like this, you know, talking to folks and traveling and visiting people and, and, and working on the next generation of vehicles and stuff. And so I had a chance to do that. And after about uh, 24, 22 years as an astronaut, um, I've moved over to, uh, to do, start doing safety work. And so I was a, the deputy director of safety for the Johnson Space Center in, in Houston for NASA. And I did that for about three years. That and doesn't it, sound like a lot of responsibility. Yeah. What's, yeah, yeah, exactly. So, you know, they, 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 was, if something goes wrong, who do they talk to? The safety uh -huh. guy. What did you do about this? But it was good because it gave me a chance to use my background in a new role in, uh, at NASA. And so I did that for about three years. And then... The opportunity came to, well, what, you know, would you want to go over to the commercial sector? So I got a call from a company called Axiom Space, and they said, hey, you know, we're interested in having you come over potentially as a safety officer for our, our, our director of safety. And so at first I'm like, eh, I don't know, I've always planned on staying with NASA until I retire, but then I thought, you know, it would be fun to work in the commercial space flight sector, 
And uh, this would be an interesting change. And so I figured, well, I'll, I'll give it a shot and, uh, and, and see what happens. And so it's been very, very interesting. So tell us about what you're currently working on. Sure. What is the next Sure. Chapter? So uh, we'll t take a look at Axiom. So what Axiom is doing is, is our prime goal is we're going to build a, a commercial space station, like the International Space Station, a place where people can do research and they can do manufacturing, outreach, and, and publicity, any kinds of things they want to do up in space. From a commercial perspective, mm -hmm. we want to open that up to business so, so people do it more often. The more people do it, the, the, the cheaper it becomes. So we're building a space station, but, but before we do that, we're, we have what's called phase one, where we're flying missions to the space station. So what we're doing is, is we're kind of a one-stop shop where people who want to go to the space station, for whatever reason, for marketing, you know, for, for manufacturing, for tourism, you know, we can fly them uh, either as private individuals, somebody who has the money who wants to, to, to go to space, or as a national astronaut. For, so, for instance, if, if Bulgaria said, we want to have our, our, one of our formal astronauts you know, fly with you to the space station, then we'll, we'll help you select them if you need to, we'll, we'll train them, and then we'll uh, send them on a vehicle up to the space station to, to, to do their mission, and we'll help them do their res put their research together. And so we mm -hmm. do all that stuff and then train them and then fly them to space. So then they can fly from anywhere from you know, 10 to 30 to you know, 180 day missions potentially. So the reason we're doing these, these private astronaut missions is to get ready for our, when we have a space station, we need to learn to work with NASA in a, in a commercial government, you know, cooperation. Yeah. And so the first step of that is to, is we're sending these astronauts up to the space station and, uh, and learning to work with NASA with our astronauts. So we, we had our first flight was called AX-1 and we flew three individuals up to the space station and I think I have some pictures here. You can, uh, this is our first crew, so on the left you have uh, Larry Connor, United States, uh, uh, Mark Pathy, a Canadian, Mike L.A. is our, our company astronaut, he's a, a former NASA astronaut, and then Eitan Stibbe, a, a, former Israeli, uh, astronaut, a former Israeli pilot, became an astronaut. So this is a different paradigm, though, than NASA. NASA picks up you know, four, you know, four or five people on a NASA crew, and you're, used, you're working together for years, you know yep. each other and stuff, and here's three people or four people who didn't know each other you know, a few years before, and so how do you make a crew out of them. And so that was a, a challenge. And so one of the things I'd say is, hey, we got to send them on a National Outdoor Leadership School uh, where we get them to bond together and learn to work together as a team. And you send so, them to the desert. So to, to, to the, we send them to Alaska, actually. So this is that crew Alaska. going up to Alaska to learn to do some, you know, where they're cold and wet. And it was a, a challenging course for them because they, they, they did get some bad weather and stuff. But it gave them a chance to... Uh, uh, to really experience what it's like to, you know, to work together. Because especially when you have some of these ultra high net worth individuals, they're used to, you know, they have a lot of money, they have big corporations, they're mm -hmm. used to doing things their way, they're not used to taking orders, but they have to take orders from the commander. Yep. And so it was important to, to, to start that from the beginning to ingrain that, and so that was important. So then besides that, they, we, we trained those crew just like we trained um, a crew from, from NASA, Got, get them in the simulator, and, uh, and then uh, they launched to the uh, International Space Station via a Falcon 9, a Falcon 9 rocket, and uh, the same ones that the NASA crews fly on now, and, uh, and got to space, and here's a picture of them with the crew, and this is what we want to see. We want to see our Axiom crew, which is the guys in the middle, integrated with a NASA and a Russian crew, and they all work together, and uh, our crew does their mission and does, does their science and stuff. Now, those three individuals, they could have done anything they wanted to. They, you know, they paid for it, so if they want to just be tourists and look out the window, they could have. But uh, to their credit, each one of them said, no, we want to we make a difference. We want to do research like NASA astronauts do research, and they did. They got human body research. They did um, uh, physical science research, and they, they learned to, how, to, uh, how to work in space, and they, they faced that same learning curve, and it, uh, it worked out uh, really good. So they had, uh, this is a picture of, of Larry doing some uh, work in a, in a glove box, and uh, it was amazing. They had a, a, huge, uh, a huge portfolio of work that they were going to do. The problem was we oversubscribed them a little bit. We gave, they, they wanted to do all this work, and we, we thought, yeah, this is, this is a tight timeline. Mm -hmm. um, but they, they said, no, we want to do this. And so we oversubscribed them a little bit. So for the first 10 days they were on the space station, they were working really hard, and we overworked them a bit. The fortunate thing for them was that the weather on the return was not looking so good, so we had to delay seven days to land. So for seven, seven days. days, they got free seven days up on the space station, which worked out great because they could finish the stuff they hadn't finished, but they could also have a chance to, you know, to look out the window a little bit and to have a little more fun, which changed the complexion of the mission a little bit more. So, so next time, we, we want to fly these missions every, you know, uh, hopefully twice a year if we can. And after that, uh, uh, that, that'll give us a chance to, you know, to, to get, again, again, more accustomed to, uh, to NASA to working with us because... As we said, the next step is going to, after we, um, 
after we do this is we're going to have phase two where we build our modules, and we have a contract we're allowed to build off of the International Space Station. So that beautiful facility you saw, we're going to put our modules on the front end of it. Oh, and it's going to be part of the... It's going to be part of the International okay. Space Station, which is great because it gives us the opportunity to, to share resources with the ISS. Sure. So we get to share cooling and power as we needed as we build our station. And uh, we're going to launch our first module in about 2024. It's being built right now in Tallinn, in Italy. Uh, the shell is we're going to bring it over to the United States, outfit it, put all the life support and other equipment in there, and then launch it uh, to the space station. And we'll continually uh, put all these modules on the space station. And then once we have our power tower, which is the final uh, module, and, and have all our, all our systems complete, then we can detach from the space station, and we'll be a, a free flyer, as we say it. So we'll be our own space station. And then ISS will probably be over by then. They will deorbit the ISS, and now we're the space station where NASA and other customers can come to. So NASA will live oh, with wow. us. That's why it's so important for us to know to work with NASA, because we're guests on their space station now, but later on they will be guests on our space station. It's, 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 it's actually really cool. It's one of the criticisms that we're seeing now with all the space tourism thing that is going on is that, yeah, it's only power for the people and millionaires. But uh, first of all, you're essentially uh, trying to prove a concept, right? You're, right? you're trying to figure out the technology, how to do it cheaply, and it gets more cheaper and cheaper, presumably. But I think it's also important that we do send powerful and important people in space to go through this transformation that you just... Right. Just describe. Yeah, because you know. we want to make it uh, space more accessible, and the way to do yep. that is to make it is is number one to work on the rockets to make them more reusable and cheaper and efficient, and that's what you know that's what SpaceX and Boeing and those folks want to do, uh, and Blue Origin, and then uh, and then we want to make operations more more efficient too, like the, building the space station. The ISS cost billions and billions of dollars. We we want to learn the lessons that we learned from the space station. And said, okay, this part needs to be very um, you know, very. Uh, redundant and it has to be very hardened. Whereas this part, you know, it, it never fails, so we don't yeah. have to worry about this so much. So maybe we can make this one a little bit cheaper. So we have to look at those kinds of things to do the same thing for the space station that, that SpaceX does for the rockets and the, yeah. and the crew cabins. So. so it's a learning curve. Well, I mean, <laughs> Rex, I mean, thank you for everything that you've done for humanity, <laughs> if you want me to put it this way. And I, I really wish you success with uh, your new endeavor. And I invite people to, uh, you know, to look into this commercial space industry because it's uh, it's really interesting. First of all, what is going on t from from a technology standpoint, but uh, you know, secondly, from the opportunities that are opening up for for everyone yes. really to fly one day. Yeah. So thank you very much for this conversation. My pleasure, Pat Coe. It was awesome. My pleasure. Thank you. Thank you.